I'm Michael Picard. I'm a cardiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm the uh, emeritus director of the echocardiography laboratory at MGH. Uh, and in the ischemia trial, I was the uh, director of the echocardiography core laboratory. Uh, so I reviewed all the stress echocardiograms, which were part of the uh, entry criteria for patients enrolled in the, in the trial. Actually, first, I probably should give you the motivation for why the, why the trial was conducted. Um, we're talking about patients with stable ischemic heart disease. And um, for years, most of, the, most of the data has really not shown uh, a benefit for an invasive strategy that is revascularization versus medical therapy. Although there's been some uh, observations and some signals that it might be that with patients who have more severe degrees of ischemic heart disease might have a benefit from revascularization. And so that set the stage for the ischemia trial. In the ischemia trial, uh, 8, 000, about a little more than 8,000 patients were enrolled. They all underwent stress testing. Uh, and if they met the criteria for moderate or severe ischemia on the stress test, they then had a coronary CT to make sure they didn't have left main disease. So if they had the moderate or severe ischemia and did not have left main disease, they then were randomized in the trial. And so uh, a little more than uh, uh, 5,500 patients were randomized in this trial. Half of them received guideline-directed medical therapy. The other half also received that same medical therapy, but also went to the cath lab and had what we called the invasive strategy. And uh, in catheterization, they had coronary angiography. And then, if appropriate, uh, they had a revascularization, which could be either percutaneous coronary interventions or cabbage. Uh, three quarters of the patients had the PCI <coughs> and a quarter of uh, the, the cabbage. And uh, then uh, these patients were followed. Uh, the, the mean follow was a little more than three years, uh, some up more than five, five years. Uh, the outcomes that we looked at were death myocardial infarction, and hospitalizations, uh, hospitalizations for heart failure, MI, or uh, resuscitated cardiac arrest. And uh, what the data showed was uh, when, we, uh, when we look at um, the primary endpoints that I just mentioned, uh, there's really no difference between the two groups, whether you've got the interventional approach or the conservative, just the medical therapy alone. Now, I should say, you have to remember, this is stable coronary artery disease. So the patients who had an acute coronary syndrome within two months were not part of this trial. Uh, patients who had left main disease, of course, patients who have accelerated symptoms who come to the doctor with accelerating symptoms or unstable symptoms don't, are not in this trial. And also all patients had uh, at, uh, an EF, uh, an ejection fraction greater than 35%. Uh, so that's, that's the profile of patients who we're dealing with. So, uh, as, we said, as I said, uh, no difference in the two, in the two approaches. Now, um, I think there's a lot of take-home messages from this. Uh, and one is that patients did very well on medical therapy. Medical therapy today is very good, which is maybe a bit different from what it was 20, 30 years ago when some of the earlier trials were on. Uh, we have treatments now that are not just ablating the symptoms, but actually modifying the disease, the disease itself. Uh, the second is that they're really... Um, I think we always had a concern that if you had a really uh, very positive stress test, really severe ischemia on a stress test, patients were at risk of dropping dead. Mm -hmm. And so we would rush them to the cath lab and really do the intervention approach relatively quickly. And certainly from this trial, we've learned that there's really uh, a very low risk of those bad events happening, particularly in the short term. Mm -hmm. So one can really start medical therapy and, and then just really take a, take a breath and, and, and decide what to do. Uh, now, a second part of the data that were presented today uh, was on quality of life. And the quality of life uh, was assessed on all patients with a series of questionnaires uh, the, and, and frequently over the course of uh, the first three years of follow-up. Uh, and the, uh, the important points are that the major uh, issue that was driving the quality of life assessment from, from a patient's standpoint was angina and frequency of angina. And so if we look at uh, angina itself, uh, both approaches, whether it's just guideline-directed medical therapy or the intervention approach, uh, relieve angina. But if you look at how well they relieve angina, the group that undergoes the intervention 
had a much higher likelihood of, uh, of a more dramatic improvement in their a much more dramatic reduction in their angina. Uh, so that if you have a patient who's having daily angina or weekly angina, uh, a much greater proportion of those had a marked reduction uh, in their angina improvement in their quality of life compared to those who were just on medical therapy. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that in mind, I think uh, there's a few take-home messages from, from the data that were presented uh, mm -hmm. from the ischemic drug today. Uh, as I mentioned before, first, I don't think there's any rush to running off to doing an intervention on a patient who has a very positive stress test, as long as they are in this category of stable ischemic heart disease with an EF greater than 35%, no left main disease, which has already been screened uh, for that, and no unstable symptoms or progressive symptoms. So I think you can take that kind of patient, start them on medical therapy, and see how they do. Mm -hmm. If the medical therapy really uh, reduces their symptoms, improves their quality of life, and they're happy with that, I think you can rest assured that, uh, that you're, you're doing the right thing. And our medical therapy is getting better. Now, if that patient uh, continues to have symptoms or uh, feel that their lifestyle is impacted, I think that's when you have a conversation with the patient and, and you do what we call shared decision making, where you really talk about the pros and cons of the interventional approach uh, uh, with, with an eye toward it. Our data suggests it should be reducing symptoms even more, and many patients will then elect to take that approach. Uh, again, uh, this is a group that if, if, if you had that uh, stress test, I would suspect you'd get a coronary uh, CT uh, angiogram to look for left main disease. If you have the left main disease, you're going to go for the intervention uh, approach rather than this path that I've been talking about today. I think, uh, I think the, the key group will probably be the group that has a positive stress test that has marginal symptoms. Uh, the, those patients, I suspect, are going to have all the symptoms taken care of with medical therapy. And that, the, the lesson from today is that you don't need that interventional approach in that group. And that's a big group of patients. Uh, I think the other take-home message is that every patient needs to be approached individually. Uh, I think it's also important to involve the patient in this decision. Uh, obviously, once we've got them stabilized on good medical therapy, we need them to comply and take that medical therapy. If they're not uh, uh, taking the medical therapy, uh, then uh, we're, we're not going to achieve our goals. One of the points that I haven't mentioned is when you look at the outcomes, outcome curves of the two groups, although there's no statistical difference between the two curves, they're starting to deviate after two years. And again, since our mean fall at this point was three years, one of the questions is if we look later, uh, is there going to be further deviation? So at three years, there's a little bit of a signal that there's less spontaneous myocardial infarctions in the group that had the interventions in the PCI and the cabbage. So the question will be, if we look longer, will those curves deviate more and will the interventional approach protect the patients in the long run? Uh, and we don't know that yet.